I'm not an expert on PyTorch. Just to clarify, PyTorch is one year old, so I'm maximally three months, seven months, somewhere in between vacation days. Okay, using it. And yeah, today we're going to tr go through this model, uh, architecture cost sequence sequence. It's fun, and let's see what we'll do. So who saw this problem from the post from Facebook? Just a gauge. Of you who saw it, who read the papers that I posted? Um, <laughs> it's very little, but let's try to get through as much as possible. So, um, there's this problem where you go to the coffee shop in Singapore and you're not Singaporean, you try to order coffee, you try to order kopi, and you try to imitate the Singaporean. What you'll get is, oh, it's not, it's not this picture. So, kopi is actually coffee with milk, it is not black coffee. If you want black coffee, you need kopi O which then it also comes with sugar. If you want black coffee without anything, you have to say kopi o koso. And the list goes on and on. And this is just six out of 100 over different forms. So for those who have not read the papers, this is just a crash course. Most likely it will take around five minutes. So who knows what's this? Perceptron. Perceptron, who said that? Okay. Is that an auto bot or is that the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. It's not a transformer. Although transformer is also another type of architecture. But all it does is it takes the input axis, tries to summarize them with some function, most likely a summation because it's simple, multiplies it with the weights that it comes with, and then afterwards go through some transformation so that it fits into. This curve is actually a sigmoid curve, which means. It just wants the output to be between 0 and 1. Or minus 1 and 1. So, who knows this one? <coughs> anyway, this is called Elman Net. This is, um, in short, this, this kind of architecture or this class of architecture is called recurrent neural net, where first you will take the x, which is your input. And then you go to some hidden state, which then it's nothing. It goes, pass it to the next one, takes the x, and then you pass it to the next one, and you try to predict the y as it goes on. So there's no input output here. The output is actually some sort of your input as you train. And as you go on, you know that it can go on forever. But because of GPU, there'll be a cutting off point, and then this is how you predict. So this is one way to structure a recurrent neural net, which is a very, very old one called AlphaNet. But this is also something that we'll see later on. So, anyone understand why is it previous hidden? That's very important. And the difference between this and the previous one? No? Okay, let's go back again. Previously, there was nothing, right? You only have one state. Everything is an X, a feature, it fits in, it goes in. But somehow now you say this X is related to this X, so you try to learn the weights between here, between here before you get to the Y. So that's why it's recurrent in a sense. It just kind of pass it on. And what's really important is this hidden state is what it's trying to learn. And you pass it on to the next one. But you realize that somewhere here, it's very hard to see what's there. So that's the weakness of recurrent neural net. Something that's very helpful, it comes from trust, a uh, block from down there. So Previously, we see this, right? But you have the input, it goes to the next one, it gets the previous, and then this is how it actually looks like. As an input, you take the previous hidden, it takes some sort of and learn and hidden information somewhere in blue, and then it passes the blue and red, it comes out with a mixed hidden information, blue, red, and then it goes on and add more until you get the final output, which then this is what you're learning. You want to know how are the different inputs related so that you can predict the output later. In short, this is recurrent neural net, and you are free to go. <laughs> oh, no. This didn't work. It worked in class, where the students just kind of left. So, <laughs> okay, for sequence to sequence, it's basically recurrent neural net in a different form. What it does, it is map the input and output sequence. Previously, we had recurrent neural nets going like this, where you don't know what's the input, the input, the output is mixed in. So after evolution in 2010, 2014, 2011, 
they came out and said that why not we put something through as an input and then generate some sort of a vector in between and generate an output. It kind of worked well for everything that has a sequence, machine translation, text generation, Python interpretation. This is actually a very nice paper if anyone read it for. And that's what it does. So you have the inputs, previously you go through, and now you also go through, but it goes to this encoder and you compress it into a single vector at the end here. So after you see this end symbol, it becomes a single vector. And from the vector, this becomes the start state of a decoder that tries to predict an output. Make sense? Anyone lost at this point? No? Okay. Maybe this is too simple. Then the code will be even simpler. Uh, yes, before anything, data much. Because no data, you get nothing. Although. Yeah, although we can't value the value of data, I think the value of data is priceless. <laughs> yeah, scientists spend around 80% of the time just preparing data and managing data for analysis. That's what I do. And it's very simple to manage data. First, you take data from somewhere. You then throw in some pandas, S-frame, dust, whatever, NLP library, get the data into some shape, then repeat until it's done. It's a nice recipe. So, I have uploaded a very small data that I just copied from a few websites, as you can see. And then we have the local term, which is like the Opo and Kopi Kata, which translates to black coffee with extra condensed milk. And that's what we want to do. So the left one is color. Uh, it's our input and this is our output. And that's what we are going to do. So let's code. Cool. Am I going too fast? Or am I going too slow? I'm going to cheat because I have a full book in here. Just in here now. notebook to code with me, but then what will happen is I put a lot of question marks that I'll try to fill in, and most likely it will help because everybody knows Python here, right? Who doesn't know Python? You should try to apply to the program after you learn Python. Not a good job. So, this is just some I hide and stuff. And what we're using is actually a Torch library. You can install with pip install. You go to PyTorch, you'll see the instructions kind of clearly in your face. So uh, this line, Can you guys see the code clearly? Is this better? So anybody know what this line does in Torch? So this line is very, very irritating. Because of this line, you have to go through every variable and say dot CUDA, just because it's kind of in the code. Yes, I trying to say something. There is. There is a way to not have to Yeah, do. you don't have to do it. There's a way to not do this? Yes, yes. Okay. So you can, you can set, based upon this use CUDA, you can set a variable equal to a type, either being a, a CUDA float or a float. And then you could use type <coughs> of that type. But if I want to change it to tensor, I must create multiple types. No, well, yes, but every one of them could be got <gasps> type with the type in. That's, that's where they like found it. It's like. Yeah. That's where TensorFlow is easier, where you just set a flag and everything runs. But uh, yeah, there is a way to, to do it. So remember this because this will pop up everywhere when you debug. Very irritating. Uh, these are just some conventions that most Torch users use. 
I don't know why they call it F because they like to write like algorithms in Octane, but that's what it's installed, right? So this is just an introduction that we went through. These are the two tables that we should try to read. <laughs> this laptop has no GPU. Yes, but it will still run because the number of rows is. Who remember the number of rows in the data? Yes, that is a fake thing. Actually, it's 160 plus. I just cut off the last one. But it's small enough to fit in. And the vocabulary is small. So, yeah. so this is a task. We have an input. We want to map the output. And hopefully, it does this. Spoiler alert. It cannot do the last one. So let's go down. Yeah. Is it okay if I sit down and type? So, um, using GenSim, this is actually a very nice library that you don't need to manipulate your own dictionaries and you don't need to do like back of words with text. You'll see it later. Um, the Panda data frames look as such as just now we have explained, and this is what you do. Remember in the recurrent neural net, there's always a start and an end state. Um, from what we see, we need to start, and then at the end of the encoder, the start of the encoder must begin. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to assign this symbol as a start, and this symbol as the end, with the index 0 and 1. And the first thing to do is to manipulate the panda data frame to what we want. Right? So let's do something like this. Please correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I'm typing out of brain, so I think I can do this. Uh, string dot lower and dot apply. So that's what we're trying to do, right? The input has capitals. The simplest way to manipulate your data is just to lowercase them. Although there's a lot more you can refer to by Py. Is it Python meetup or PyData? Python meetup talk, but yeah. The simplest way is to lowercase them, and then this word tokenize is a function from NLTK. Or you can use any tokenizer. In this case, you can actually dot split uh, spaces that will also work. So the idiom is actually kind of simple. You have a data frame, the column. Because string.lower is a function, you can do this, and then we apply it. Like <coughs> this. So uh, there's a lot of code floating around doing like this. Please don't do this. And then dot apply word tokenize. Oh, sorry. And then sometimes you want to remove the stop words, and you have a stop word list. You go like stop word some list. Blah, blah, blah. And then you dot apply lambda x x. Just for your information, this is the right way to tokenize and then remove the stop words. Some people have been like doing it multiple steps and doing apply again and again. Apply is actually a very, very expensive um, operation, so try not to use it. Oh, sorry. It didn't look so low. Can I have a remove this? Yes. So, so yeah. This is the right way to tokenize and remove stoppers together at the same time so that you don't don't use to apply. 
So yeah, that's all. That's what we get, right? We get a list of tokens, which is a list of words that we want, with the start symbol added and the end symbol. So the problem is, uh, this is very nice. Actually, you can fit this to a recurrent neural that you'll accept it and say that this is very nice, uh, but then Tosh will go kaboom because they like numbers and they don't like characters. So the first thing to do is to convert them into numbers like this. And that's where you use GenSim dictionary. <laughs> this is a hack, actually. So if we look at this, and I just add So if I just do a dictionary of the English sentence, values. <laughs> Anybody know how to create the thing? Okay, it's okay. We'll get it. Dot, vocab, dot. Anyway, let's, let's just do this. So with the dictionary, you can actually fetch the word. So let's say zero, and then you have um, one. <coughs> you see there's something wrong <coughs> anybody spot what's wrong no yes the order because what I wanted was to get zero index here and one index here and if you just let the dictionary decide it will just go in some sort of hash because of how hash is just random so one way to force it is to just to say that I have a document of one word with s and a document of one word with the n symbol and the unknown words. Okay, unknown words don't occur in this exercise at all, but then I'm just putting in for fun. And that's how you hack it such that um, if we do this, let's try it. And then afterwards, you add in all the documents that you want, which is in the English sense. That still happens. No. So that's one way to hack this part. Is this too boring or? I think this is actually quite important because, um, yeah, I don't know why. So we get English sentence like this, and then the very, very fun part is just now we created the vocabulary. We can actually just feed in any English sentence and do a dot, dot to IDX to get the IDs that are in the dictionary. So if we have this English sentence, right, when we do English vocab dot dot to IDX. And I got all minus one because... Oh yes, who knows what is wrong here? Because your dictionary, you did not put any other word. Not true. Who knows what's wrong with the we execute? Yes. I commented this time. It's a stupid error. Sorry. But yeah, that's what you get. So there's, there's one thing here. This is actually a very new feature. So if you can't do this and you see this attribute error, just do pip install dash u gen c, you'll get it. And we requested for this. Like This is very helpful. So now you can do vectorize. Everybody is talking about factors. But um, this vector is a list of integers, which is not very helpful because PyTorch wants everything to be a variable or some sort of a PyTorch data structure. So you need to convert it into this variable question mark, question mark, dot. Who knows how to solve this? I actually don't because I'm pretty sure it's wrong. Like some long tensor because it wants a tensor and then they 
I get it right? No, I'm going to cheat. This part is the one that's not very large. Anyone knows what's wrong? No? Yeah, this is the part that uh, PyTorch should just remove the Python part. Okay. Because, Okay, so yes. It's kind of unintuitive. Why is it not there? And if you import all types, you're just going to mess up your namespace. So just remember this by heart or cheat like me. But never mind. Is this still very boring or interesting? Just a check. Continue. And what we really want is to in remember our inputs are pairs of sentences, the inputs and the outputs that we want to fit into the model. So that's what we want. And if I just add the send pair here, I should get something like this. Where there's an input and an output, it always starts with a zero, always ends with one, because that's our start and end symbol. And in between, it's some coffee something I can remember because I remember what's tree. It's always coffee. And yes, the sequence of sequence model. Um, the general idea is to take two neural nets and transform one to the other. And that's where the uh, encoder and decoder comes in. The simplest kind of neural net you can code in, um, actually this is not the simplest because it's GIU, but a very simple encoder that you can code is just to take the input, put it through an embedding layer, then it becomes embedded, which is the output of the embedding. Feed the output of the embedding to the GRU, which is an RNN. Uh, I'm not going through what's a GRU, just imagine it's an RN you see there with some superpowers that can remember. Yes, I'm going to hand wave all this. But remember this previous hidden? This is what makes an RNN an RNN, so this is very important. And what the RNN always produces is output and the hidden. So, question where does the output go? Where does the output go to the encoder? Partly correct. Okay, for this case, it actually goes nowhere because it's very simple. Then where does the hidden go? Yes, I only hear a few people in front. I sense the aura, but yes, the hidden. The output, the hidden will be the encoding. The output will be the encoding, but it does nothing in the encoder yet because it just get passed on to the next one. But then it is the hidden that really move. So if we look at the slides. Remember, it's the blue thing that moves, and blue things are hidden for now. Oh no, it's the answer. <laughs> okay, so, so where does the hidden go? Anyone from the back? Nothing. Okay, we know that this is the previous hidden, so this hidden is going to get looped back here to the next state, and this is why it's recurrent because it's looping all the time. It's too key. Yay! So. Just remember this graph, or no, I should not try this one. So we have the input, right? So this is how you <coughs> create a class of um, architecture or network itself in PyTorch. You always import from the module because all, all kind of network or encoders, decoders are all modules. There are ways to do this separately, but remember always use modules. They will always use this super self in it because there are other things that you can initialize, but then I'll skip it. What's that's really important is the input size and the hidden size. That's where you need to decide how many nodes do you need to put here. Can be 10, can be 20, it doesn't matter for now because we're only building the architecture. As we move on, you see that we're just taking in the hidden size and we say this network contains a uh, hidden size of this, and then we have to create an embedding. Anyone know how to do this? It's really simple because this part is more Pythonic. So neural dot embedding, and embeddings take um, two things, right? It takes the input and the hidden. No, no, yes, the hidden. Size. This is how it's encoded, so it takes the and then if we go on, the GRU does the same thing. It takes the 
TRU and then input size and then the size. I think I'm wrong here. Anyone correct? Yes. Yes, that's where I'm wrong. No, no, it has to take the hidden size because that will determine. Oh, so, so the input size is the number of words in your sentence. That's going to be the input size. The hidden size is the number of notes in that menu. You have to know how many notes are there. So it has to take a hidden size. In this case, I'm making the hidden size of the embedding and the hidden size of the GRU standard. But you can separate it out and say hidden size one, hidden size two. So I'm just being very lazy and I say hidden size. All size of hidden, um, all, all embeddings and hidden uh, layers are all having the same size for now. So does it make sense? So embedding always have a size. It could be size one, it's still a size. Wait, it cannot be size zero, so it must be size more than one, one or more. Similarly, remember when we move forward, our output and the hidden is just trying to move the GRU again. So I have self.gru, uh, which is here. And it takes the same thing, the input size and the hidden size. I have a question here. Yes. Uh, so uh, typically for NIP pipelines, you take the input and you change it to some embedding like word array or fast text. So what's the difference between word array fast text and this embedding that you have right now? Yes, there's no embeddings in word to back that will give you copy all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's a bad joke. But, but uh, the, the thing is this. There's a few ways to get embedding, right? One is you can don't train this at all and make it fixed. But what I'm saying is I'm using the embeddings as part of the training to train a new set of embeddings for the given inputs that I have. Ah. So if you want to use fast text or glove or word to back, what happens is you remove this and says all, all of these weights are fixed and you don't train them. <coughs> then you wouldn't need the variable, you don't need the embedding layer, you just need to need, use, uh, I think, pre-trained layer or pre-trained module, module dot pre trained something. But that's, that's where you can replace this with something else. Okay. And actually that's very fun. That's and then um, remember that we always start with some sort of hidden state. For now, let's just say we create a one one hidden size. Who knows what the size of this is? Self-approved shouldn't be taking the embedding yeah. somehow. Should be taking the embedding previously. Yes. Sorry. You are right. And the previous hidden. Yes. Anyone knows why? Nobody? <laughs> Sorry, but let's go back again. So, it's very simple. Once you have drawn this graph, you just ask a professor to draw the graph for you. And then as an engineer, what you do is you make this graph into a code. So you put the input. So this is initialization, but then when you move forward, you need the output of the embedder, which is here, and the previous hidden, which is here. Sorry, I mixed that up with the initialization. So when you create the embedder, it is going through the embedding, and then it just shapes it into a single vector. Anybody knows what's minus one? It took me 10 minutes and killed my brain. Nobody knows what's minus one? It's a universal. Sorry? It's a, it's a flexible size. You are not specifying any dimension. Yeah, why don't you use style question mark? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very strange. So, it will never blow up because it doesn't do anything. It's a function, or, uh, it's an object. So the decoder is a little more complicated because somehow the default tutorial at the ReLU, but then I'm going to skip it. I'm just going to tell you it's a nonlinear unit that we see in this slide here. This F here, it's just a transformation. You can put any transformation you like, you can alternate your transformation every other loop if you like it, but that's just going to be So most people just keep it fixed. So similarly, we have the same thing. Remember, the decoder is just some, some sort of extension of encoder, but then in this case, you have to predict an output. Just now the output was pretty much useless. 
So the input goes into the embedding, it goes through the transformation, it gets to the GRU, takes the previous hidden, which comes from here, produces the output, which then these are just embeddings, they're just numbers, right? What you need to do is a softmax. A softmax kind of choose what is the best fitted for the case. So in the case of machine translation, you have the input vocabulary and output vocabulary. The output vocabulary is what you want to get the output here. So this the softmax converts the numbers in the embeddings and then chooses the best fit and fit it to the vocabulary. Does it make sense? Most likely it doesn't make sense now unless you see the numbers or you have done this before. So we'll get through later. That's the really cool thing about PyTorch. You can just kind of inject halfway and say print something. You can't do that in TensorFlow unless you use eager mode that will never be deployed at some point. I don't know, but yes. Same thing, right? It's very simple. You get this graph from a professor, you just code. And it's like torch for embedding. It's the same thing. You don't have to embed I'm just going to write all this. So this is kind of strange because in this case, in the input, we have the input size, that's our input, and the hidden size. But for the decoder, the input is actually the hidden size, right? Because it comes from the encoder. And then the output is going to be your output size. So you kind of swap it around. So you have your hidden size here, which is your input, and then your output size. And then the GRU does the same thing. It takes from, oh, there's a ReLU. Why is the ReLU missing? Oh, later. It's not moving. These are just initialization. So we have neural net, GRU. Size, output, size. At any point of time, if you think me typing the code is too boring, sound out. I can just skip and copy and paste. Okay. Ew. So this is the part that I always forget because it uses me. Basically, the softmax gives you a certain number. The linear will output the output that you want. But I forgot what's the input. Most likely. No, it should be the size of the output. So these are all initialization, so it must be all sizes. It's nothing to do with the movement of the input output. Yeah. It will blow up later if it's wrong. Then I'll copy it, please. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the graph again, we have embedding going to ReLU and then from GRU. So this is the thing. You have embeddings with the string minus one, one, minus one. Now who knows why this happens? Actually, there's no good reason why you should do this because this is just an interface of PyTorch. You can look at this discussion uh, with the link here. But just remember this because this could have been a single vector, right? One times one times minus one equal to just a minus one, which is any size that you want. Yeah. Actually, there's, there's a reason why this sequence length and all that. I'm just going to skip it. I think it's. It could be a lot simpler in terms of the interface, but just remember this because that's why I don't put question mark here. I can't remember. The radio is very simple. It's just an F. Every time you have non-linear function, always call from the F. And radio, we can change this to a sig mod if I'm not wrong. Stick with radio. So after the radio, it takes into the GRU, right? So just type GRU. Cell dot GRU takes the ReLU and the previous sequence. So ReLU, which is the output, and the hidden. And then it goes through the softmax to output the hidden. This part, who knows how to type this? You are initializing the hidden steps, the hidden state from the start. How do you type this? Anyone? It's a one line answer. Don't type this, copy and paste. Because this is exactly how you will do from the encoder. Remember, encoder and decoder is just an imaginary boundary that you draw. But to the RNN, to the, to the network itself, it doesn't really matter. So it's exactly how you will initialize this. You could initialize it differently for the encoder and decoder. But the simplest way is to initialize the same way so they can debug it easier. So this is the cool part. When you train a model, you don't need to do like wait till the end until you print something. So I'm going to go through this. 
Remember, we have the hidden size that you have to determine for every kind of layer. For now, I'm fitting the hidden size to all the same. There's a learning rate of the optimizers. Anyone don't understand what's optimizer and learning rate? Just double check. Good. And then the batch size is just how many times you want to see the same data again and again. Sorry, the epochs is how many times you want to see the, the data again and again. The batch size is how many data points you want to put per time you iterate. The criteria is what you're optimizing on. For now, we are just going with the negative slot loss. And then the maximum length is a hack. Actually, when you decode, you can keep on going forever, right? If you look at the slides again, I'm always going back to these slides because they are good. It goes dot, 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 dot. How do you know when to stop? Anyone? Anyone? Yes? Okay. Yes, the slash S is very important. Actually, the start symbol has no meaning and you can drop it. Don't tell your boss because your boss will ask you, why? I don't understand the output and the input, but it works. But anyway, just put it there. The slash s itself, the end of symbol, is actually more important than the start. So that's why you need to set the max length so that you have sanity, and then you can actually look at the slash s. After some experiments, you realize that actually this can go down further because at some point you'll just keep on producing slash s and say this is the end, 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 and so on and so forth. So what we have, the same thing, the input vocabulary, the output vocabulary, I'm just doing this so that it's easier to see. Remember the encoder takes the length of the vocabulary, which is the input size and the hidden size. The decoder takes the reverse, where the hidden size is actually the, the, the input is actually the size of the encoder, the hidden size of the encoder, and then the output is the length of the output vocabulary. That's where this part comes in, where you need to do dot CUDA again. Although it's not necessary, you found the correct thing to do. Optimizers, you can change this. Optimizers always come from the Optim module. There are several. Uh, SGB is the most common. And then what you do is you take the network. Every network has a parameters. But then we didn't declare this. So where did the parameters come from? Answers? No? Okay, the parameters actually come from this line. Super dot init. It kind of created many, many things that you don't see. But then uh, it's natural to create the parameters because that's what we are training. Remember, the parameters are the colorful words that we see just now, right, from the hidden states. And then the learning, learning rate uh, as per the SGD. And then we create sample data. So in this case, I'm just randomly creating, picking up batches of sentences from the bag of sentence pair I have and across each uh, batch, which is epoch. And I have a type error. Yes, it's wrong. I knew it. It's the dot linear. So, okay. When you see this, learning experience. Uh, when you see this, every time you see this dot nm error, most likely the linear can only go into the decoder network. So if we go back to the decoder, this is not our size. What should this be? Yeah, here. I don't know, I'm going to check too. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, ah, it's correct, but the linearity actually takes the hidden size of the Why? <laughs> Oh yes, so output size, I'm not sure why it takes a hidden size. I'm going to just leave it there first. It shouldn't blow up this time. But logically it should work. Yeah, it works. So let's just add a line here. For sanity, understand what's the training data. So the first one is a batch. This is the first batch. And this is the second sentence. Or the first sentence, we have a pair of sentences which is our something something gopi and this is strange, there's 25 here. Okay, never mind, I don't know why it translates. So when we do the training, it's just uh, trying to extend where it is here. So first we set the hyperparameters, then we start the training. Right? 
we iterate through the batches. For every batch, it reinitialize the optimizers because they should go back to zero. And then the log loss will be zero also because that's what we're calculating, and then we'll add it up later. And then um, here, we go through each batch, which is the start sentence and the end sentence. In this case, they're called variables because Python like the word variables. <coughs> Encoder hidden is, Input variable and variable. Yes. No. No. What should you do at the start of the encoder? Question. Random. Random. Partly correct. So what should you do now? Remember our uh, this line here, we have this initialized hidden states that we don't remember. So that's partly correct. You can actually initialize it randomly, but for now we are just initializing zeros. So we should do uh, look through the matches. Encoder dot initialize state. And it doesn't blow up. And then we iterate through each state, right? Because this is just initialization, and there's nothing going on. It's just initializing all the input states and output states. So the question is this. Why did I already initialize in the class, but now I've initialized it again? No? No? You answer? Actually, in the class, I initialize nothing. There's no real numbers going in. This is the real part where you, after the class, you try to initialize and put the numbers in, right? This is, so this is the really cool part about PyTorch, where you can just do this and see. Um, we look through, and then we see that this is the last variable, right? This is the last variable, we got about size, and then we see that the size is four, and then we put the variables in, and then now we initialize. So in this case, the encoder outputs and all other things in the class itself has empty values. It's only when you're here, when you start training, you put in the value. So at the end, we have this again. Remember, we go through the, um, each state. We start with zero. After the first state, we have the first um, word itself. And then we try to put it into the encoder. So how do we type this line? You want to? I'm just going to type it. But it's not. Remember our input is the input variable. What do I call it? Yeah, the input variable. And then this is just an index. And I have the encoder hidden that was initialized. Right? Remember our graph? The input variable is just the first word that we created here, that we read from the, the data. And then the encoder hidden is the one that we have initialized here. And then it runs, and then we iterate through. So, yes. It blows up again.
Amazon book runs from the full one. sharing the full one. Anyway, so the cool part is here. Whenever we move along the states, we don't really know what's inside this encoder output and this, this encoder hidden, what are they really? So if we just look through, at the end we have, we have already reached the last sentence and then from the last sentence we can see this. <coughs> sentence, we see that the encoder has, oh, this is just printing what's in the encoder. The encoder is an embedding of the input size and the hidden state 10. And the GRU just has the hidden and the previous hidden, right? So if I continue typing the data batch, which is here, and the final sentence, and the first word, uh, and the first uh, part of the, the copy part, which is the English part, we see this. But if we move on, we see that the, and the last sentence in terms of is Teo Gosong. And this is what we're interested in. We don't really know what's the encoded output, right? From here, we just see that the graph puts in the encoder output to the hidden and then just keep on looping by itself. But if you look here, this is just four words, five words, five words. And we look at the encoder output, there are actually five rows here, right? See that? So that represents the state as we move on. And you see all these zeros here. We see the size is 2010 because we put a maximum of 20. And the type 10 itself, is the size of the embedding and the size of the hidden states that we put across. So that's the nice part of PyTorch, where as you go on, you can debug by looking at this. And there's something cool. Yes, you can also check what's in the hidden state, which is very interesting. The hidden state itself is this. Okay, let's go back here. Right, you have 0.6154. And the hidden state, remember, is the, the the hidden state is going to be passed to the next state. That means the hidden state is actually the previous state, right? Kind of mind wrapping. But you see that the hidden state is the previous state that was existing here. It's exactly the same. So RN ends, you have settled in already. But then these are just the encoder. If we move on to the decoder part, it's the same thing. Uh, let's go to the question mark first. Test my knowledge. Yeah. Errors. I touch. Prints. Prints. Decoder layer. So after we print out, uh, after we encode it, we want to move on to the decoder itself. It's the same thing here. You need to initialize a variable where we use the strange part, touch of variable. And initialize the value. <coughs> initialize the start. So it must be the encoder output. Oh, sorry. This is actually wrong. So, sorry, this, this part of the code actually comes from the tutorial of PyTorch. You initialize it with the start state because you always create a start. But actually, this is not needed because you could easily initialize it with the output of the hidden state here. But let's just follow and play on with it because um, remember, since we added the start symbol to every sentence, we should start the start. I think this was skip one and just say go on. And then you get the input. And remember, this is where the decoder state is. Oh, 
Wait, why is this blue up? This should be dancing. Oh, sorry. Anyway, just go through this. That'll be easier. So the the start of the decoder hidden state is actually the end of the decoder hidden state itself. And when we decode, we get decoder input and decoder hidden. And then we see all these strange syntax coming on, like why are you doing this when you have the data and then you pick the top k? Top k is actually the best, which is the soft max at the end. But if you look at it, this is what it's doing. Right. If we finish the loop, get to the criterion, and there's the output. If you look at the top k, we see the output. The last word is actually this, and it's mapped to 107, 106 columns, and what's 106? <coughs> is the vocabulary size of the output. So it's trying to map what is in the output here to all the out, uh, it's trying to map the decoder output to the words itself, and what you see here is a log probability that it's belonging to the index. So this dot, top K1 actually picked the best, and that's why you see uh, the best decoder guess of the word is actually wrong, it's actually the. Yes, because this is, uh, I didn't train anything. Remember, we are training on how many batches? <coughs> uh, we are only training on batch size of 2 with 30 pops, so that's like 60 times. So, that's the coolest part of Python. You can go home now. Anyway, let's finish this. So after you pick the best output, you update the loss criteria. And then when you see this symbol, you break, although you can continue, but it's senseless, so just break. You propagate the loss backwards. See, this loss here is loss within the batch. And then before the batch, the loss is zero. You back propagate the loss, and then the encoder and the uh, encoder and decoder optimizer need to step through to the next step. So, that's all. That's the sequence to sequence. But let's put everything together, put it in a function, get some nice library. Basically, I'm just printing out like how many seconds and how many minutes it takes to go through and show a very nice graph. And this is exactly the same thing as you see just now, but with more candy. Like you see, printing out loss, printing out loss. So we set the hyperparameters again, we reset, and we start training. Remember, the input size is to distinguish the vocabulary length of the input, and then the output is actually the vocabulary length of the output vocabulary. This is exactly the same thing as we see just now, but I just put it in the function so that you can see clearly. The and it blows up. Time is not back on, I did not press through. Let's go back. Let's press, 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 press. And yes, this is the most satisfying part of your job if you do AI because this is common. But uh, let me explain what this is going through. So remember, this number here is the criteria that we're trading on. This is, this is the criteria you are training on, which is um, the log loss, which I don't know why it became positive, I think because of the square. But anyway, so this is the loss, the lower it goes, the higher the accuracy of the system. This percentage is because I had a fixed kind of iteration and I say that you go through so many epochs, <coughs> so, many bad, so many data points per batch, that's why you can calculate this easily. Normally when you train, you want to train this until your GPU breaks or AWS send you a And it goes on and on, and then I keep on talking and get some coffee, so it will finish soon, I guess, at some point. You see it's getting lower, which is good. So, yeah. Oh, wait, the graph is missing. Okay, the graph is missing, but then I should be able to check the graph here. Oh, no. 
there should be a graph somewhere. I think I missed stop plotting. I'm not going to retrain. But anyway, the, the next thing that you need to really do after you train is to put in your code to save. Um, this is actually very cool. This is called F string in Python. You can actually just put the variable inside the curly brackets and then you can just save and it will save. So getting the model to translate, now this is the part that you say I'm just a, a, I don't know, crook and I'm telling you something, it doesn't work, it just shows the number. So let's go through this because this is the last step. Uh, the decoding part, which is not called decoding, I should call it it takes in the model that you train in with the input that you want to translate and then the max length is just for sanity again I'm just going to use the same one I put the input variable and the size the same thing that we did initialize the state like how we did previously for each sentence we initialize it to zero and then we move on again then the variable itself is exactly how we initialize our encoder itself and then here is the part where you look through each word in the you look through each word in the input variable in Python this could have been this sorry I'm not just not right. yeah this is bad Python you should not look through this way because the index is there but yes this is just looking through each word and then as usual we have our encoder that takes in two input one is the input variable and the encoder hidden. Then the end, we loop again. It, no, we store the encoded output. And then, why is this going with this? Encoded output EI, it says this, it overrides. Yeah, this is the same thing where it just says, take the encoded output, repeat again, and then put it back in the encoder hidden. Which actually, this whole thing is not used at all. Which reiterates my point in the graph just now. Outputs of the encoder has no use. If I do this, should not affect anything. So the decoder input, same thing, we start with the start index. We put in the input and put it to the Buddha. Remember the hidden state is, the first hidden <coughs> state of the encoder is the end state of the encoder. And then we want to keep the list of the words. Now the same thing that we did when we step through doing training, the decoder takes the input of the decoder and the hidden state, and then we do this top. And that's where you get the numbers out here. But this is the special part. When you get to the input, what we want to do is to not get the output of the hidden state just now, but you force the force the input of the next word to become the softmax of this. This will give you a clearer kind of thing. So and every hidden state is kind of fuzzy, you don't know where it is. But since you are sure, what you can do is to force the input of the next state with what you are confirming as the correct output that you want. So in this case, this is some sort of teacher forcing, but it's not really because it's not teaching. We are just forcing the output to give you the fastest output as fast as possible. Because in this case, we know that the beam gets smaller and smaller as you go through, as everything um, in the encoder output becomes um, 